Hi, hello, it's your boy Nate. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. Y'all, let's get into this, because I have 20 books to talk about. Yes, y'all, 20 books for June. June gloom. I was just running away from all of my responsibilities. Sucked myself into some litfic reads. Let's do this. Please don't take me seriously. I'm in a miffy shirt, and... There's a bunch of narratives going on. It's going to be hard to talk about 20 books within um, a collective span of minutes. So let's do this. I started off the month with a carryover from May. Any person is the only self by Alyssa Gabbard out by FSG. This was fun. I just love a good yap sesh. And this was Gabbard's yap sesh coming from isolated stillness from um, the pandemic. This is definitely her pandemic baby. And it's just an essay collection on books, reading, rereading, journaling, just the love for fiction and the act of reading. Gabbard's just that kind of gal where you're seated at brunch and she yaps, 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 and it's been five hours and you're like, where did the time go? Cause you're having such a jolly time. You sit there and let her speak. And maybe sometimes the ideas don't collectively align to the very end of her essays, but it's just such a wonderful brain space to be in. I, I just love all of her running thoughts and ideas, and she's always such a joy to read. But yes, if you like books on writing, reading, this is definitely for you. Then I have a physical read. We did After Dark by Haruki Murakami. I believe the vlog is already out. I read this first when I was like 15, 16, and I think it still holds up. It's a soft spot favorite of mine. It doesn't dwell too deep into the magical realism, but it definitely has that like lonely diner vibe to it. Strangely enough, reminds me a lot of Videodrome by Cronenberg, not in like the sci-fi horror elements of it, but sort of like, what does it mean to have a body? And uh, the duality of the body in terms of the physical and the spiritual as Murakami's characters in here follow suit with the usual outer body experiences that they undergo. It's still a classic, um, a favorite of mine, and I enjoyed this a lot. It was good to be back in the sort of becomings of teen Nathan, so this was a joy. Oh, this was like up to here, if y'all needed to know, because I was just like, gotta get the brain working, 20 books. How do we do this, y'all? How do we do this? All right. Why is this out of order? <laughs> okay. Next, I read Lot by uh, Shola von Reinhold. And you know what? This is so Bibliosophie coded. <laughs> and that's it. That's the whole review. Because, like, if you love Bibliosophie, then you will love this. It's just very much her. Archival, full of history, full of art secret society uh it's it's kind of, it's fun it's a lot of fun read this for katie james book club and i hope to make the meeting i always feel awful that i miss it i trust like last two times that i tried to make the meeting i was literally in the sky i was in a hunk of metal in the sky how do i attend how do i attend anyway if you love sophie you will love this go out and pick this up for the love of sophie and then i did Ooh, Like Love by Maggie Nelson. This is her recent essay collection by Grey Wolf Press. And this is about a series of essays out of something that Hilton Alls said um, about, he was working on this exhibition and he wrote or spoke of a piece about um, a collective group of artists that he loves and loves without reason. Reasons that you can make, I guess, but reasons that are just love, like love. And this pretty much is a yap sesh for Maggie Nelson to talk about all the artists that she just loves. And it also spans sort of the creations of her previous essay collections, Art of Cruelty, as well as On Freedom. And this sort of maps out the becomings of both of those books. And yeah, it's a joy. I love Maggie Nelson. She's just such a fun 
brain to be in. I feel like she's just the university education that I miss, and it's great to be in the classroom uh, with Nelson's work, but she goes over Matthew Barney, whom I feel like a lot of people forgot about, but he was this like visual media artist. He has like two or three films out, and uh, it's really hard to describe. It's not body horror per se, but it's this intense costuming that deforms the body, and it's incredible the way his use of makeup and costuming are incorporated to create these like really, really surreal images of the human form. And it was so nice to like be in this essay collection and read up about him because I remember I watched his films. Uh, what was it? There's this great, I don't know if it's still around, but in San Francisco, a great uh, video store where you could, like this was before everything was on streaming. This was Mubi, this was before Letterboxd, this was before everything, before, you know, the internet, essentially. And there was this video store where you can essentially rent movies that was like that were like really, really hard to come by, like foreign films, crazy stuff from Japan in the 80s and stuff. It was, it was wild. And they had this like intense collection of different films. But like to rent one, it would be about like five to seven bucks, which was, it was steep. And um, I had no money. I was a starving college student. How could I afford all of this art? But it was great. Such, uh, what is it called? Video stores and, oh, you know what? If I remember, I'll have it there. But yeah, Carol Walker as well. Hilton Knowles. I just love when artists talk about other artists outside of their medium. And it's just an interesting think tank to be in because you realize like how does process work and how do they get to their arts through these processes and yeah always a joy solid essay collection um great for in between your reads Ooh, <gasps> oh my gosh y'all i read fou de vincent by herfe guibert this was gifted to me by eli love you so much thank you for bringing this all the way over from France to Korea. And yeah, I read this in French. This is like first time in a long time that I've read something in French from front to back. And this is wild. This is diary, memoir, poetry, fiction. We don't know, but in its auto-fictive formations, it's about our narrator who is just enraptured by love, lust, obsession, by this skater boy named Vincent. That you can say crazy for Vincent or a fool for Vincent. And I, I really like fool for Vincent as a translation, but ah, oh, so good. Like I could absolutely reread this. This reminds me a lot of um, A Simple Passion by Annie Erno and uh, just the gay version of it so if you want the gay version of A Simple Passion by El No, this is, this is up your alley. The prose is so lush and beautiful and sick and twisted that it comes off as just honest in that really intense, crazy kind of way when you obsess over something. What is life without obsession? And this is just a lot of fun. It's a quick, short read and the music really is within the prose. Something that I can easily pick up and reread again and I think my younger self would absolutely appreciate this a lot more. I, I still appreciate it, but if I found this when I was like 16, I would have gone head over heels and obsessed, obsessed. Sort of like, you know, the first time a t teenage boy picks up The Story of the Eye by Georges Bataille, you know? Anyway, amazing. Merci, Eli. This was so, so good. Okay, next up I read The Last Sane Woman by Hannah Regel. This is out by Verso, Verso Books. And this is about an artist who isn't making the art that, that she needs to be making. So she spends her hours at a university archive dedicated to women's art because she, quote unquote, wants to read about women who can't make things. And what starts off as DWM becomes epistolary, where it looks over a series of letters of this failed female artist um, in correspondence to her friend who is very much like our protagonist. And it's really interesting, the comparisons between what, what art is now versus art then and the struggles of being a female artist. And I thought this was fine. It's a solid three stars for me. It's a debut and I think that's why. 
not much to say. But yeah, if you're looking for a DWM that sort of tracks what being a woman is and what art is and the relations between the two, this is for you. Ooh, okay, I don't have this with me because I finished it in one sitting at a bookstore. I did Foster by Claire Keegan. Oh my God. Oh my God, I want to buy this book. It is so, I don't know how to stress it enough, but the economy of words that Keegan is known for is just immaculate. Like this is the perfect story in its form and structure and how many layers it has in conveying what it means to have a family and for those who grew up without one to find family, like found family. It's so lush and quiet and it's about life and death and love. And it's just so, so beautifully done. I could reread it over and over. This is a timeless classic, honestly. I need to just read the entirety of Keegan because so, so precious, so, so precious. Like I wanna make Foster an annual reread for me whenever I miss my family and just um, trying to find love again. You know, I think what it is, is that like sometimes you don't love your family. You don't know how to word or phrase that when you're growing up and then you find love again when you find different communities. Then you go back to family and then you, you learn again how to love them again. Anyway, <laughs> woof, you're not my therapist. Uh, where was I going with that? Um, anyway, so good, five stars. Just do it, do it y'all. It's so, so good. Okay, what the hell is this called? <laughs> Yikes. My computer is so sick and tired of me. Okay, I did Mary Ventura and the Ninth Kingdom. This is a short story by Celia Plath. This is a really cute edition out by Faber Stories. They have these like, it's almost archival in a way where they save short stories and then put them in book form. And it's really cute. I love the artwork on them and yeah, I just, I love when publishers just go out and pick out little stories and give them to us. They're so, so cute. Anyway, this is not good, <laughs> which is so funny. The Gabbert book that I just talked about, um, Alyssa Gabbert talks about this, how uh, she loves Sylvia Plath, her poetry. And when the publisher sent her this, she didn't particularly enjoy it because it's not a very good short story, but you see the kernels of where Plath is, um, working with. She's working from the well. You you see the pools of her ideas and uh, the ongoing swimmings of it all that will further develop into something like the bell jar, which is interesting because I feel like this is one branch of the fig tree. It's about a woman who hops on a train and and you don't necessarily know where it's going. She doesn't really either. Is it going to a particular destination? And it's slowly that you realize that it's not the destination that you think is of place, but rather perhaps of idea, heaven, hell, purgatory, who knows? But it has a very hopeful ending, which is really interesting. I think if you're a fan of Plath, this is interesting. For Plath completionists, this is for you. But it, overall, it's not a very good short story, but like you can finish it in one sitting kind of thing. It'll take you like 15, 20 minutes, just do it. But it reminds me of the beginning of Woody Allen's Stardust Memories. I think you can find a clip of it on YouTube. It's linked in my Goodreads review of it, of the book. Yeah, just interesting. Um, to, sometimes I like looking at the bad work just to see where everything comes from or what they're trying to, what artists are trying to do and how they achieve it later in their life. Okay, what else? Ooh, okay. On Spotify Premium, they have audiobooks now, which is great, but it's so dumb. You're only allotted a certain number of minutes for audiobooks. And I just don't understand. Like I pay $10 a month for Spotify. Like why am I only allotted a certain number of minutes for a book? I don't understand y'all. And they're upping the price. Now it's gonna be like $11. Like what the heck? What am I paying for? Anyway, I did Down the Drain by Julia Fox on audiobook and I haven't done an audiobook in so long. This was amazing. Solid five stars. Julia Fox has lived, not even life. She's lived cinema, cinema, biopic film when. Like this is insane how long of a life, rich of a life that she has lived, but it's about girlhood 
essentially about dealing with nasty men, dealing with film, dealing with death, dealing with running away, finding yourself again, dealing with female friendship. It's just everything. And the insanity in every situation that comes after her is just like, it's crazy, crazy. Oh, I just love Julia Fox. And if you're a fan, you will love this crazy, crazy life. A wonderful collection to the canon of celebrity memoirs that we've been getting. And this is a wonderful, wonderful edition. Love it so much. Okay, then I read And Then and Then What Else, an essay collection by Daniel Handler, also known as Lemony Snicket. Um, I like Handler's work. He just has this way of, I don't know, his prose is like snappy, fun. I don't think a lot of adults give him enough credit for the work that he does, but he's like an eclectic person and I love his tastes and stuff. And this is part memoir, part essay collection about writing, the writing life, um, reading as well, everything that has informed him as a writer. And it's wonderful. There are details about his life that I think he was writing about for the first time here and you see it and it's so open. It's so personal. At moments, very beautiful. There's a great part where he talks about rereading. I think I mentioned this before, but it's on cancel culture and how one must read everything. You develop your own sense of self, your own opinions. It's not right to just simply cancel an artist, not having looked at their work, not seeing what the work is doing, but it has made me realize that like, are we done with cancel culture? I think there's like a tier list. Like how bad are they? Is it a corporation? Financial means, all of that. Like it, a lot is entailed, but you also have to look at the art for the art itself and see what it's doing, what it's accomplishing and if it has been accomplished. Sometimes, I don't know, what irks me sometimes is that like you'll see reviews on Letterboxd or Goodreads and they'll give these books one stars just because it exists and that the artist exists. But it's like, you gotta do the work. You gotta understand where the art is coming from and if it's successful in its approach and attempts. Anyway, read everything is the main point and with that you get to form your own opinions. And by read everything, I mean like read everything outside of your comfort zone, read everything that you like, read everything different forms of media, poetry, prose, fiction, nonfiction, what have you. That's why we're here. Great, great essay collection and memoir. If you like Lemony Snicket and if you love writing on writing. So yeah, there you have it. Okay, ooh, we got a physical read. Um, thank you to, oh, Simon & Schuster for sending me The Ministry of Time by Kellyanne Bradley. This is about time travel in modern day slash future UK, where the government has its grip on uh, time travel technology, and they're trying to understand how to use it to the country's advantage, essentially. And in doing so, they kidnap a person from the past, and it's this fun, cute comedy of errors and wordplay about then and now, it's just fine. I think there's an audience for this, but what I want to call this is like a Netflix book, a Hulu book. Like, it's just something that just works better in the medium of, say, a miniseries or a Netflix movie. It's a romance as well, and I don't know, I just didn't think it was all that funny. <laughs> just because, I, I, yeah, again, I think it just works better as like a Netflix movie. It's very much that. It's like Netflix writing. Does that make sense? Anyone at all? Does that make sense? And that's that's literally just my opinion of it. I'm sure it's getting some sort of adaptation because it, it would just work better. I think because it's just so ambitious as a novel and those are the thoughts. Next up I did Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. This is a reread. I read this first when I first left high school going into university and I drove. It was like a seven, eight hour drive and sitting in the back seat with like full sun it was august it was just hot and the ac just wasn't working it, so having read this first it was a alienating uncomfortable read but it was my first time reading didion's prose and it just awakened something in me i've always claimed that this was a favorite of mine 
And yeah, I've just been in this mode of rereading things that have made me, and I can see it. I can see why this made me. And though it's not a perfect novel by any means, it's one that still works for me in the way Didion's prose works. And having also rewatched the documentary on her, The Center Will Not Hold, um, I realized how, or I've forgotten how personal of a book this was to Didion and, and her move from New York to LA because of her husband, who I wouldn't say is so much abusive, but was a bit controlling and essentially made them move. Um, and she, at first, there was hesitation for her. And so for her to be in LA while also dealing with the murders of Sharon Tate and uh, the Manson murders that were happening and uh, the state of the world at that time was in ways of exercising demons that she didn't know how to contain or control and so she wrote this and yeah it just makes me appreciate it a lot more i don't know if this will show up in a vlog but still classic didion and still hits hard such a great summer read can you tell i'm doing a horrible job at this oh gosh and i am getting sweaty y'all oof okay whoo Next up, I read As an Arc, The Anthropologist by Ansegal Savas. I've not read White on White, so this is my introduction to their work. This is out by Bloomsbury. Oh my god, this works for me. At first I was a bit iffy. I was like, hmm, I'm not, I don't really, I don't know. This is not, this is not it. It had this like very particular twee voice to it, but it's about a couple looking for apartments, envisioning a future, as expats and it's about their relationship, love, language, the boundaries of language, um, making new friends, uh, but it's very much in that like late 20s, early 30s moment of life where like what what do I do for the rest of my life? Like what what do I love? Who do I love? Is, is this it? Is this all? Or the very experience of this book is like sitting on a park bench with your lover and looking at every single life at the park and imagining lives for them. Yeah, there are just moments to this where, yeah, I just like looked up from my Kindle and just looked at life. It made me look at life and I think that's what I love about it. It's very much slice of life and if you are an expat, I definitely wreck this because I think it captures the uh, loneliness of being an expat as well and yeah such a joy next up i did <laughs> both three and four of nana and this was so much fun yeah you really get into the dramatics of their living situations and it's just lots and lots of fun um i think which one is it i think it's three that is the most nope four i forget but i think my favorites out of the books. I've only read four, the first four, but these two um, are my favorite so far, um, just because it just captures the very essence and spirit that I think I, Yazawa, wanted to have both these characters be expressed in, in the punk elements to it, and just sexual liberties, and, and the becomings of friendships, friendships of opposite sex as well, and the feelings and dramas between those. Lots of fun. Then as an arc, I did Toward Eternity by Anton Herr, out by Harper Via. He's done it again, y'all, this time in his own words and own story, but this is near future world where new technological therapy is quickly eradicating cancer, and the body cells are replaced with nanites, which then um, plays into the story about what language, translation, history, trauma, memory, uh, queerism, um, and finding virtual immortality. It's wild. It is really contemplative and meditative almost in approach to language. And it's so interesting because her is an incredible translator. So for him to put out this book it comes from the heart and it's such a joy to read his ideas on what language and translation are. Yeah, in this sort of giant leap of faith in ambition, in science fiction, and it works, I think. I highlighted a bunch because I, I think uh, there are moments to this where it made me think about like the translated work I read and 
um, the meanings that sometimes I miss, the meanings I wish I had. And it's ever so beautiful um, to have an artist like Anton working within this field and working towards something bigger with his own work. Um, but yeah, if you are a fan of Anton and the work that he translates, just go support the boy. I love him to death. He's amazing. Love you, Anton. Okay, we're almost done here, y'all. Almost done, and my camera's dying, so we gotta we gotta speed this up. I did as an arc banal nightmare by Haley Butler out by Random House, and this is the feel bad book of the year. And I think she got this award last time for something else. But this book will make you feel so sticky and icky. It is about 30 something year olds who are all so ugly inside and out. Just the things that they do, the people that they quote unquote love, it's just yucky. It's, ugh. I just turned 30 and this is what I read. It just makes me feel so uncomfortable going into my 30s. And if you're looking for a feel good book, this is not it. <laughs> These are not the vibes, but I think Butler was successful in creating really, really unlikable characters, unlikable situations, and runs with it. And it's really interesting in terms of uh, what we do with unlikable characters within fiction. Hats off to Butler for making icky, icky people in an icky, icky book. Then, as an arc, I did Medusa of the Roses by Navid Sanaki, out by Grove Press. In modern day Tehran, it, it's about childhood best friends who are gay. It's just drenched with incredible poetic prose. So much lust, so much eroticism. What happens when you as a queer person are oppressed? What is suppressed? And then what comes hammering down on you and how do you act out? How do you act and essentially how do you live? All of that is explored in this really sexy, sly novel. Um, I had a good time with this one. Made me hot. Really, really hot. Okay. <laughs> then I did, as an arc, Tell Me Everything by Elizabeth Strout, out by Random House. And this was so good. I have not read the other books, but this has such like small world, big world vibes to it in Maine. Set in Maine. And it's just so cute. Just like the neighbors and them talking and uh, what history means to them and living out the last years of your life and looking back and it's just so beautiful and this book is saying love thy neighbor and i love that we don't have those good christian ideals out there anymore and it's just nice that this is this is the book and so beautifully painted it's this beautiful kincaid it feels like and so lush and so full of life and that's what i loved about it strout good writer and I had a good time with this okay okay last book Whew. as an arc I read 100 shadows by Hwang Jung Eun and this is translated by Chung Ye Won out by Tilted Axes Press it's a bleak short novel set in the slums of an electronics market in Seoul it's about two guys who um, dropped out of school to become repair shop assistants. And it's a book that it's a social critique of modern day Seoul, looking at economics, how does it exist in a hyper-capitalistic state, and is a bit magical realism in that the characters, or one of the characters, uh, their shadow leaves them. And it's haunting in a way that it's always at the edge of something unknown, almost as if you were stuck in a thick fog and you can't quite see what's in front of you. Deliciously done in that it's very quiet, very eerie, uh, doesn't hit horror so much, but it is unsettling in its quietude and very bleak because um, it looks at a soul that that is I don't think people realize this, but Seoul developed so, so quickly. And because of that, shortcuts were made in terms of the education of some people. Having the elderly, for example, experience a kind of mutiny where they can't live up to society's standards because retirement or retirement pay isn't good enough. Yeah, it's just hard. It's hard to be working class within Seoul. And um, is an incredible look at how the very public of Seoul and how they 
deal with not so much a financial crisis, but a major economic issue as uh, Seoul continues to further develop itself in a hyper-capitalistic state. It's a bleak one, we'll say that. Um, and those are all the books I read in June. Let me know what you read in June that you really loved. And as always, y'all, I'm a Blackwell's affiliate. Love Blackwell's because of inter like free international shipping. So if you enjoyed me talking about any of the books that were mentioned, go downstairs, affiliate link down below. Have at it. Helps me a bit and helps the channel out a bit to keep putting out videos like this. Anyway, as always, be well, do good work, keep in touch.